everyone. Welcome to the Founders Foyer with me, Aishwarya. This foyer is full of conversation. The space where creators, founders, and builders look for all the support and concepts to grow their ideas into products. Innovation is what most of us immediately point to when it comes to product success. But how often have we innovated our own thinking? Have we ever discovered what it means to be at the intersection of interests, ideas, and impact? So many creative endeavors are based on a portfolio of skills, careers, and people. And getting into the heart of that is really important. And I have exactly the person who can help us do that. With me today is Christina Wolf, who dons so many hats, founder, podcaster, professor, and author. She's currently a senior lecturer at entrepreneurial management at Howard Business School, where she co-leads Heshmi's Startup Bootcamp, and it's an active angel investor and startup advisor. She's also authored the book, The Portfolio Life, that's going to be live very soon. Hey, Christina, thank you so much for joining us here today. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Let's get started. A self-described human Venn diagram. Wow. I love to start learning, and I'm sure every time I'm going to remember our conversation, this is going to just pop up in my head. From being like a theater director to classically trained musician, and now to computers, tech, and entrepreneurship. Tell mm -hmm. us your journey into teaching you know, to tech and other walks of life. Sure. So I, I ended up coming up with this phrase, a human Venn diagram, um, right after I finished business school. It was like 2011. I was fundraising for my first startup, which was in fashion. And I was really struggling to describe quickly. You know, you only get about a minute when you meet someone new, especially in a fundraising context. Um, I was trying to describe my background, my interests, what I bring to the table without sounding like a dilettante or like someone who was really flaky. Um, and I, I tried out a bunch of different angles. None of them worked until one day I just said, I'm a human Venn diagram and I've <laughs> built a career at the intersection of business, technology, and the arts. I probably was a little tipsy when I said this. <laughs> and, um, and the investor just smiled and he goes, I love that. You're clearly yeah. interdisciplinary. Tell me more. And, yeah. and so I really, I, I landed on this phrase as a way of expressing that even from when my earliest memories in elementary school as a child, I've always been interdisciplinary. So it mm. wasn't that I had one interest and then I was like, mm, I don't want to do that anymore. I'll do something else. It was always that, you know, I remembered in like the fourth grade, they asked what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, I want to be mm. an author, a professor, an astronaut and president all at the same time. <laughs> like it was, it was crucial that I did them all at the same time. Um, I'm never going to be an astronaut. I'm probably not going to be president, but I have done the other two as an author and professor. So, yeah. so there was always this interest in doing sort of both and, right? And, and in any team, in any industry, in any room mm. that I'm in, I bring an outsider's perspective as well mm. as an understanding of the room that I'm in. So I started my career in the arts, <laughs> classically trained musician on several instruments, um, studied theater uh, as part of my undergrad and thought I would go be a director in New York. <laughs> and I, I moved to the city. I tried to get a job. They're few and far between. So I was like, I'll work my way up. And I started realizing um, as I got a day job at the Metropolitan Opera on the management side that I really liked like producing, that I liked the, mm. the business of, the management of, as much as I liked the creative side of the arts. Right. Um, and I was also realizing that the nonprofit economic model that the arts yeah. are run off of in the United States is not that sustainable. <laughs> um, and in particular, it doesn't pay very well. Uh, and mm. I don't come from family money. I don't have other sources of income. Like I need my job to pay me enough to live on, um, which is not true in most of the arts. So I decided to go to business school to learn a little bit more. I was like, I don't understand why, but there's clearly a reason this industry works the way it does. Mm. And when I got to business school, I discovered entrepreneurship, the world of technology. My other uh, major in college was math and computer science as part of that. And so I was like, oh, this is interesting. I can use this other skill set I, I've developed to be mm. creative, to build yeah. new things in the same way that I did in theater and opera. Um, but do it with a more sustainable economic model. Do mm. it as a for-profit instead of a non-profit. 
And then over the course of building a series of companies and, and taking venture capital dollars, which is not altogether unlike begging for philanthropic dollars in the nonprofit <laughs> model. I was like, hmm. So there's still some tweaks that might be uh, might be valid here, um, but but got to really see a range of, of building different types of businesses and different types of industries, and that's yeah. what led me to being a professor. Um, it was at a, a crucial point in my mm. family's progression where we had our first child, we wanted a second, and the life of an entrepreneur, especially in the earliest stages, for me didn't seem compatible with the type of mom I wanted to be at this mm. stage. And I really needed, I needed a job that was a little bit less of a roller coaster with a little bit more predictable of an income and a little bit more autonomy, control over mm. my time. And it was the perfect opportunity to come join the faculty and get a chance to teach and advise entrepreneurs and stay connected to the industry. And mm. I get to use all of my skills here too. Yeah. You know, I, I teach, it's not unlike performing. It's a lot, actually, it's a lot like improv, like improv comedy. Because exactly. the case method, it's not lecturing. I'm co-creating every single class yeah. with my students. I have to listen really carefully. And yep. that's incredibly uh, just, you know, uh, energizing, right? Like every day I get to go and do that. Um, and and then, you know, spend my time with student entrepreneurs and, and advise, you know, big corporates as well. So I still get mm -hmm. to do kind of a little bit of everything. And I just managed to find a role, at least for right now, that that is designed for me to do a little bit of everything, which is kind of the best mm -hmm. of all worlds. Yeah, for sure. And wow, that was like a five taco. <laughs> you said energizing. <laughs> that was really energizing for me. And I'm of course for the listeners as well. Because I love how um, all of these, though, you rightly mentioned the word dilithar, because often we have this thing in us that we think, okay, I like this, I like this, but, you know, I keep doing all of this only for a very short period of time. So uh, is it mm -hmm. completely wrong? Or am I just going to be amateurish? Is it okay if I'm not a master in it? I think we yeah. just have a lot of these questions that run in our head. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that you tried to put a picture through every little step that you took forward. And now at the end of, you know, teaching, I think all of these are culminating, right? Like you said, mm -hmm. uh, improv is a great example or, you know, like a kind of a reference that you can always look back to say, how you learn new things every day. It's not just the students, mm -hmm. but like I said, you try to blend in some of your interests from the previous chapters of your uh, journey and then try mm -hmm. to map up with whatever students like us who come talk to you every day. And that it, it, it does, is energizing. So I'm glad you yeah. walked us through this whole journey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's, uh, I think of, I'm pretty sure it's attributed to Steve Jobs. I don't know if he actually said it, but it's something mm -hmm. like you can't connect the dots forward looking. You can only really yep. connect the dots by looking back. And I yeah. think what's so interesting about that is it requires us to be, or I guess encourages us to be like naturally curious. Your point of like, yeah. should I do this thing if I'm only ever going to be an amateur at it? And I think many of us who are high achievers really struggle with being bad at mm. something and right. still doing it. <laughs> I don't yeah. like it. Um, yeah. But I think there's a lot of value in just saying, I'm interested in this. I'm curious about it. And I want to learn more. I want to try it. I have no yeah. idea if I'm going to be good at it. I might fall yeah. flat on my face, but it's worth trying because I'm curious. Yeah. And, and I do that without an agenda, without like, a, and this is how it's going to be useful to me 10 years from now. No, mm -hmm. it's like I took improv comedy when I moved to New York as a way of making friends and of still sort of being in the creative community, even though <laughs> I wasn't directing yet. And then it turned out 10 years later to be a really incredible experience that, that has yeah. a ton of value. Now I, I bring like improv trainers <laughs> in to coach the other professors. Um, so so part of this is allowing yourself to be naturally curious and and pursue these interests without an agenda without a plan for how mm. it's going to help you, just do it because you're interested. And equally so, give yourself permission to stop mm. when it doesn't fit anymore. So yeah. I didn't start doing improv and then like keep doing weekly classes for the next 10 years. I did <laughs> it for a little while. It was really fun. I made some friends. I learned some new skills. And then I had other things that needed my time and attention. And I thought, okay, like, if I continue on, could I maybe audition for SNL someday? Like, I don't know, maybe, but that's not the point. So yeah. if, an, 
it feeds into this idea of a portfolio, which is the whole point of, of this book that I just wrote, which is like, you got to think about your life the same way you might think about a financial portfolio. And yep. not like the sun is coming in. I have very dramatic lighting. Um, <laughs> and you're making a dramatic and, point as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> giving you. And as you <laughs> think about your financial portfolio, you want to make intentional choices of how you allocate your money, your capital. Do I invest in this or that, right? There are trade-offs. And you might say, well, for this phase of my life, for this chapter, I'm going to mm -hmm. allocate my money this way. Maybe when you're young and you could take more risk, you might make slightly riskier investments in the hopes that they'll pay off, right? This is the argument of like, keep your money in the stock market when you're young and then like switch it more to bonds and and more stable investments as you get closer to retirement. So it's like yeah. this analysis of what do I need for this chapter of my life? And then what's the balance that I am going to seek, right? Is it I have a, mm. a big, big job and that only leaves a little bit of time for like one kind of moonlighting process or project that I'm really interested in, mm. you know, time for my family and some you know, focus on my health, my rest. Um, maybe you say, I'm in a period of transition. And so I'm going to dial back that commitment to the big job. I'm going to do like a good enough effort, <laughs> which is totally reasonable. And then I'm going to open up my time to invest in two or three or four other interests because I'm not sure what comes next. And I want yeah. to, to broaden before I focus again. But it's about like, what do I need right now? Mm. And what's that balance? And maybe... I have a few things that have a 0% allocation for a little while. Right now, I have two small children. They're 11 months old and three years old. I don't have time to sing in a choir, which is something I've been doing since I was like eight years old. I've been singing yeah. and performing my entire life. And right now, that's at a 0% allocation. And that kind of <laughs> sucks. But it's true to the phase of life I'm in. And it's not forever. Oh. Like, it's going to come back <clears throat> someday. And that's okay. Yeah. And it sounds more like what you would do day to day as a product person as well, right? You keep prioritizing the things. You look at what makes absolute sense at that point in time. And then you give the more focus towards that, like more weightage there. And then rearrange the other things in your list. So it sounds more like what you would apply in your very own um, company or your very own team, which is what you get to do with mm -hmm. your interests as well. And, you know, yeah, it it's, really feels it's like... like it's it's sort of, um, I, I can see how some people might be annoyed by this comparison or insulted by it. it. It might feel very crass, but I feel it's like being CEO of your life, right? Like yeah, thinking about yeah. you, your life is your enterprise um, and how do you manage it just like you would manage a business. For people yeah. who understand that analogy, I think it works really well. For people who are like, that's too no. capitalist. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> well, uh, you do you. But, you know, I, I exactly. always think about it as uh, it's a lifestyle. Uh, it's kind of a mindset. It's it, it, it's not like a shutter where you say, okay, you know, I'm out of work. Just just switch that off. Because it's more mm -hmm. of a mindset. It's going to continue right. with you just as you think about in different walks of your uh, thinking and uh, just yeah. as you apply across your different interests. So mm -hmm. um, like I said, for the ones that doesn't get applied, well, okay, you do you. For the rest <laughs> of them, <laughs> for the rest of them, I think it's a, it's a great analogy that they can pull in to, to have this comparison across the different stuff that they do. And you know, yeah. like what I really enjoyed about uh, the couple of points you made is I it, it really feels like meeting a mental doppelganger because often I tell the friends and folks in my circle that why do you always have to attach a label to something? Why do you always have to start a project or start an idea with the thought that, okay, am I going to be like great at this? Am I going to be bad at this? Am I going to be good at this? Why start with too many of self-introspection questions when you can just start mm -hmm. with a level of curiosity? So, you know, that feels like it, it kind of matched with exactly what you said. And often that's what we do. And most most mm -hmm. ambitious builders and founders do that, um, saying that, okay, this is my way of introspecting a lot, but then you end up overthinking and you end up not really experimenting with the stuff that you want to do. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So totally. And uh, I think it's a good practice, uh, which I remember you also ran a podcast where you uh, mm -hmm. covered all of these intersections that one could take with creativity between uh, tech and a lot of other aspects of it. So I guess mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what you spoke in the podcast also could cover some of the things that we just discussed, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, this the idea to write the book came after doing this podcast for, I think we did mm -hmm. it for about four years, covered about three seasons, uh, over a hundred episodes. And it, it came out, we started the podcast, my co-host Kate Scott Campbell and I, 
um, started this show because we met each other through a mutual mm -hmm. friend. And I was like, I'm a massive theater person. She was a theater math person. And I was like, hold on. Okay, so there's <laughs> at least two of us in the world. And anywhere that there's at least two, there's probably a lot more. And so we started this as an effort to find other multidisciplinary weirdos like us. I use that <laughs> word lovingly um, <laughs> because we felt like such outsiders in most of uh, most of the kind of the plans or the roadmaps yeah. or the, you know, the playbooks that people put out in the world that were like, get a job, move up the ladder, be good at it, like retire. And I was like, ah, A, oh, that doesn't work for me. B, I'm not sure it works for anyone anymore. Um, and, and so I was like, okay, there's two of us. Let's find everyone else. That's like an, an interdisciplinary weirdo like us. And so we started just talking to a whole bunch of folks that did that did intersecting things. Generally, the lens was something in the STEM world, something in the arts world, but we were very generous in that that um, interpretation. And, and we found over and over again that all of these folks were really approaching their lives with this portfolio mindset. That it was sort mm -hmm. of like, I pick up this thing, I might put down that thing, that thing might come back in a few years. I work with these collaborators. At some point, they might become important to me again on another, right? Like, it's just, it was yeah. this mindset of like, nothing is linear. It all felt very circular and very um, sort of intersecting and overlapping and like, like chapters, right? Like seasons. And yeah, it, it was this moment that I was like, and, and we kept hearing from our listeners of just, how freeing it was to finally have a label for what they were feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I never really um, thought about that until I was like, oh, right. That, you know, it's the same way that like you think something is going wrong with you and you finally have like a word to describe it. And you're like, oh, okay. It's not just in my head. This is a real thing. It was in the same way. They're kind of like, I feel like I'm strategic and intentional. And my superpower is the fact that I have access to all these different worlds, these different networks, these different ways of thinking. But when someone meets me or sees my resume or hears about some of my experience, their reaction doesn't line mm. up with what I think my value is. Their reaction is one where they're like, can't pick a lane, right? You know? Yeah. And they're like, so it's just the ability to put put a word, put a name to it, gave all of these folks permission to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really powerful. So I, I wanted to turn this into a book and I had started writing many of these ideas. I was a columnist mm -hmm. for Forbes for several years and I was able to, to preview some of these ideas in small forms, which is a great way to write a book, by the way, yeah. to write snippets of what you're thinking and put it out in the world and see what yeah. the reaction is, right? I could see in real time where mm -hmm. maybe there were questions. I didn't explain something thoroughly or where there was a lot of heat. You know, one particular piece literally goes viral every year toward the end of the year because it's about goal setting and how you think about managing your time and your your priorities. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. the, these ideas are really resonating. People are looking for kind of a framework or a, a title yeah. for what this thing is. Let's pull all of this together and offer it in a book that's sort of the equivalent of if you could spend a day with me working okay. through your career, your life. Like it's very hands on. It requires post its and pens and, you know, some time, just like any good project management does. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was just sort of, I want to give you permission to do this if this is already what you feel a connection to. Yeah. I can I can already bring in jobs again to say round pegs and square holes because I'm so glad and I, I can understand how liberating it is to finally understand that that there are people out there and they also go through the same uh, kind of thinking, same ideas, mm -hmm. same thoughts, just not wanting to fit into a certain aspect, but just wanting to get free and explore a lot of other things. So I, mm -hmm. I think you made a great point with um, letting them find that support system trying to understand that it's, it's totally okay to go through that way. And uh, mm -hmm. co coincidentally, in, in, in very recent times, I was also like chatting with a few of uh, the folks that I know about how way back then, let's say in 16th or 17th century, we had scientists, mm -hmm. we had we had talent, people who were just about doing anything and everything in natural sciences, in, ma in mathematics, in astronomy. Yes. And they, they just yeah. never sat there to say, 
Okay, you know, I am going to be interested only in medicine. So let's, let, let me just do that. But over time, I guess, we just kind of branched out to different streams. And it's good. <laughs> not saying that's wrong. But yeah. somewhere, somebody put this thought into our head that if you like art, you can't be a good mathematician. Well, what's, what's the you know, bad <laughs> connect between both? <laughs> you are literally making the argument of the entire first chapter of this book. So I, oh. <laughs> my, my, um, my like go-to retort when I was in high school, you know, I was on the math team, but I was also a musician. Then I got right. to college, I double majored, I triple minored it. Every time someone said like, when are you going to focus? My response was like, why should I have to focus? Leonardo da Vinci never had to focus. Exactly. And I, exactly. I, I go all the way back to like, <laughs> polymaths used to be a thing. And you know yeah. what happened when polymaths were a thing? The Renaissance happened, right? This rebirth of new ideas and this explosion of creativity and invention and science and art. Yeah. All of these things happened because people... People sat at the intersection instead of going into silos. And there's a, yeah. there's a very valid reason. It's called the the Western sort of industrial <laughs> industrial <laughs> movement um, that happened, you know, with factories and specialization and all these things that that caused us to narrow in and really think much more focus. But we are yeah. at an inflection point. And I think that it feels even more true today with like the boom of AI in the last few months. Yep. We are at an inflection point about what work is going to look like, what careers mm. are going to look like. And I would argue that if you want to future proof your career against all of these continual disruptions, good and bad disruptions that are going to come our way as they have been <laughs> coming our way. <laughs> You cannot focus and yep. narrow in on just one thing, one industry, one job, one skill set, because there's True. a very good chance that that is going to just disappear. And then you have nothing else. So, so this permission to be a lot of things, to find the connections between seemingly mm -hmm. unconnected ideas, that is not just like a feel good, like be, be all of who you can be. It's also a really smart strategy. For Absolutely. thriving in the midst of disruption. Yep. Especially with tech getting integrated into a lot of our everyday lives. The way we yeah. see how our thinking maps with the way tech is progressing forward, I think it's definitely going to involve a lot of intersection as we just talking. And you mm -hmm. know how you quote Davinci, I have this tendency to always quote Einstein. Because when I, I really get annoyed when people start this concept about left brain and right brain because for me I'm like well there are two sides to the brain that's fine but as long as you keep it aside because often these end up becoming as tags and people say those who are left brain can't be right brain and vice versa and I always pull an eye and say okay wait he can play the violin he can also like uh, give you equations he can also mm -hmm. do anything and everything in art so why make all these segregations and and why would you why would you Defy neuroplasticity of the brain. Like why? So you know. So you will you will love this. Um, the left brain, right brain framework is bad science. It's not true. It's not true. Um, yeah. I, I go into this in the book too. <laughs> like clearly, yes. you, you and I are aligned on so many things here. It is misinterpretation of some neuroscience research from mm -hmm. the late 1960s where they were trying to understand, you know, how different parts of the brain absolutely do inform different different things, right? We, we know this, parts of the brain um, control how we see, parts of the brain control how we hear, right? Control heat, sensitivity, all these other things, our touch. But, but the research didn't show that like the left brain does math and the right brain does, does creativity. Yeah. It, it showed how actually the two mm. sides of the brain have to work together in many cases. And that the, this particular uh, experiment that was being run um, was showing that the left brain provided uh, uh, the words for describing something. Uh, in this case, there was like a box. And when the, the right brain was, you know, sort of activated, they did this mm -hmm. experiment on uh, epilepsy patients who had mm -hmm. had their corpus callosum, which is like the, the tract of nerves that connect the connect two you. sides, that that corpus callosum had been severed to prevent seizures from spreading across their brain. So, um, so they had this opportunity to basically like activate only one side of the brain or the other. And in this case, 
when the right side of the brain was activated and the left side wasn't, they could see a box, they could point to a box, but they literally couldn't find the word no. or box. And so, um, uh, but the left side, when they repeated the experiment on that side, they could find the word for it. And so in this case, they were able to show that like both sides are involved in seeing it, processing the image, <laughs> understanding it, but the left yeah. side was where it sort of activated the language mm -hmm. center. So mm -hmm. it, it ended up being a, a journalist for the New York Times completely misinterpreted the findings, <laughs> wrote this whole story about left brain versus right brain, yeah. and it just blew up. And I think part of it is in the same way that people like having a word to help describe this framework, people also mm. really like the simplicity of like neat little labels. Oh, well, of course you're bad at math. You're right brain, right? Like it's easy yep. to, to categorize people, to put them in neat little boxes. We do this in so many other ways too, right? Like mm. we boil mm. someone's humanity down to their race or their gender. Yes. We, right. We, we do this a lot. And so it's, it's understandable that this idea of left brain and right brain has mm. become uh, sort of pop psychology, yeah. but it's Absolutely. not true. Like everyone, when they are a child at some point draws with crayons, everyone, <laughs> and just because you stopped drawing with crayons doesn't mean you lost your creativity. You lost your ability to, to make, mm. it just means you haven't practiced that muscle in a while. Yeah. Um, right. So, so I think that's where um people are self-sabotaging in mm. kind of cutting off parts of themselves when in reality yeah. it's just hey maybe you should go exercise that muscle if you haven't <laughs> in a while yeah i mean this also stops people from looking beyond where they are most times they just get stuck in that cycle and they feel like okay you know this is what i get this is what i'm supposed to do and and more so yes. because it's a it's a collective uh, uh it, it's more like the average out idea from just a bunch of people around us which also mm -hmm. is like we're conditioned to think about in the same way and like you said mm -hmm. you just use all these labels as as a feeling to identify yourself with something so I, i'm so glad you brought you broke so many myths and you kind of cleared a lot of things that often runs inside my mind because you know when I have these thoughts I I would often think okay wait am I the only person going through all of this because I, I had problems with just identifying like what's the need to identify yourself with always a certain pattern why can't it be a little mm -hmm. fluid why can't mm -hmm. your identities be fluid and each time you want to pick something why uh why should you give a reason like you said why would I want to do improv um you know people often ask you this question are you going to be a comedian? No. So why do improv now? So why would you have to give a reason to do something? So right. I'm glad you're covering all of this in the book. I can't wait to get your hands on it. <laughs> yeah, clearly. So, yep. And I guess a lot of what we spoke is, is also involving that constant refresh. You know, when to pause, when to rewind something, when to basically refresh and try something from the beginning. So, yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's a lot to do with just practicing these things every every day and, and getting there uh, by just discovering new truths about yourself. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of this is is requires a level of self-reflection um, mm -hmm. and and desire, right, to, to try something different. I'm not going to try to convince folks who are perfectly happy being <laughs> their, you know, uh, uh, simple label and doing the thing that they're doing. Um, but But part of it is also just the ability to to recognize um, what I need and mm -hmm. what I want. Uh, because many times, you know, I, I work with folks, um, a, a lot of my students are in their late 20s, early 30s. It's sort of a natural inflection point where you've been in the workforce for about a decade. And usually the, the conversation goes something like, I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the thing I thought I was supposed to do. I might be even reasonably good at it. And I'm not happy. And they either are looking for reassurance that like, yeah, no one's happy. <laughs> like that's what being an adult is. Um, yeah. Or they're looking for permission to blow the whole thing up, right? Like quit your job and go to yoga teacher training in India. Um, and they're probably disappointed when when I don't give them either of those answers. <laughs> and instead, I, I lead them down a conversation that's like, okay, well, why aren't you happy? What about your current situation isn't working? And that requires uh, quite a bit of work to focus on like, okay, well, I, I want these things in my life. I need growth. I need community. 
I need, um, uh, you know, validation <laughs> that what I'm doing matters. Um, I need, uh, you know, I need money. It's a real thing. Um, and yeah. I'm getting some of those things from this job, but mm. I'm not getting all of them. And so they have this, this perception that there's like a perfect job somewhere where they mm. can have all those things. And sometimes they have that belief that like, oh, if I just go found my own company, then I will have all of those things, right? Maybe I should just go be a founder. And I'm like, Haha, well, you're not <laughs> going to get work-life balance and you're not going to get uh, clarity on cash flow. <laughs> like there's some <laughs> downsides to being a founder. Um, yeah. but, uh, but I think there's this, this belief that there's a perfect job in the same way that we sort of have this belief that we're going to find this perfect life partner who's going to be everything all in one person. <laughs> Yeah. And and my pushback is like, do you need to have all your needs met in one mm. job or in one person? Or can you meet those needs through a portfolio? Could mm. it be that like your good enough job is good enough? And you think mm. about moonlighting, you think about starting a small business or um or doing consulting or you know, picking up a hobby that you don't monetize at all. Um, are there things, is there a community that you could find outside of your job? Um, do you need to be best friends with the people you work with? Or could you join a field hockey league and and find those relationships, those adult friendships elsewhere? So it's this um, it's this mm. sort of uh, prompt to say, like, you have to be really clear on what, what you need and what's missing right now, mm. uh, as well as I, I want them to dream big. We dream really big when we were kids, you know, um, I thought I could be president and an astronaut at the same time. Yeah. And then we grow up and we start to add the constraints of practicality. Well, that's not going to happen. And mm. I think in some ways we stop dreaming. So one of the exercises in the book is it's called a hundred wishes. And it's literally like, I want you to sit down and write out a hundred wishes that you have for your life. These aren't things you're going to do this, this year, right now. It doesn't have to be realistic. But if these are things that you are like, on my deathbed, I want to be like, yeah, I did that. Like, write it down. And part of this work is then taking a look at what do I need that maybe I'm not getting right now? Mm -hmm. And also, what are some of the big wishes I have for my life? And am I going toward literally any of them <laughs> with how I spend my day currently? And as long as I'm making some forward progress, I'm like, okay, maybe that works. And I just need to adjust a little bit. If I'm if I'm not making any progress, I did this work with uh, with one particular client who was like a corporate lawyer and he was really good at, he was partner track. He was like doing all the things and, uh, and he did the hundred wishes and he's like, so I don't have a single wish out of 107 that have anything to do with corporate litigation. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Okay. okay, so what does that tell you? <laughs> and and he ended up making a really big change. He didn't quit his job to go to yoga teacher training, but he did quit his job um, to to write a novel. And um, and he was still able to practice law on the side. He was still able to get some income from that. But it it right. made him realize that like somehow he had ended up on a path and was really good at that yeah. path. Which I think you know overachievers often find themselves just because you're good at something doesn't mean you should do it. Mm. And um, and he had gotten so far away from how he wanted his life to turn out that um, that he needed a really big course correction. But yeah, but a lot of this really comes down to you got to be in tune with what you want. And part of that work is recognizing that what you want may not look like what everyone else around you wants. Mm. Uh, this is really hard at Harvard, where there is a really strong kind of culture to want a certain set of things to that success looks like a certain set of things and for people who who don't want that they can feel like should I want that are my wants wrong um and so this requires you to really find comfort and stability in knowing yeah. yourself and being able to stay true to what what makes you happy Mm -hmm. And the type of impact you want to have in the world, even if that doesn't look like everyone else around you. Yeah. 
and just get comfortable with diversification. I think if anything, mm-hmm. it teaches you how to how to grow comfortable with those different paths that you have inside your head. And you feel like anytime you feel the fear to take the first step forward, uh, I guess a lot of what you were just mentioning is to just take that plunge, just just try okay. that out. And then you would be able to post correct. You would be able to understand where should you maximize? Where should you minimize? And just mm-hmm. draw the narrative once again from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then when do you rebalance, right? We go through these natural chapters in our lives. Yeah. And it is totally normal to, to get to a point five, six, seven years down one tack and say, okay, my life has changed dramatically. Maybe mm-hmm. you have a partner and kids. Maybe all of a sudden you need to take care of your parents. Maybe you're an empty nester and you're like, wait, I can go do a lot of things now that my kids are grown and my responsibility has changed, right? So so there are these natural inflection points where it's totally uh, reasonable, normal to say, wait, my needs have dramatically changed. Maybe my wants yeah. have even changed. And mm-hmm. it makes sense to make a, a readjustment, a rebalancing of my portfolio, rather than thinking about it as like, well, I got to blow up my whole life and try <laughs> something else, right? Like it never has to be that extreme. Um, yeah. And this is where the portfolio, as you said, like the diversification really helps because you might take something that was a moonlighting project, a little small business, mm-hmm. and you might say, okay, I think I'm ready to go full time on this. And you take what was your kind of good enough job and say, maybe I just consult for them. So that becomes the minor project and the mm. business becomes the major project and your portfolio just had a rebalancing. Yeah, exactly. Like you said, just try to rearrange parts and find new stories each time. And you know, what I love about this is it's not coming from the standpoint of guilt because often people, uh, th- when they think about changing the career or when they, when they think about trying something new or just re- rearranging everything that they had in their plan, it's often like, you know, I used to do this, but it's been so many years and I feel guilty about it. So whatever you just mentioned is not coming mm-hmm. in from the angle of guilt, but it's just embracing the fact that you did something, you want to it. It's okay, you didn't do it for quite a while. It's fine to put <laughs> it back now. So that that angle to it is definitely refreshing, unlike yes. the usual story that most often we go about. I mean, so I quite literally, I had to practice being bad at things. I, there's a whole chapter in this book about failure and failure is like the scary, scary word that can mean a lot of things. But one of the things I learned, my first company failed rather dramatically. Um, but, but one of the things I learned from that experience was like, you can practice failing in really small ways, right. uh, to get really good at recognizing when something isn't going right, mm-hmm. what might you need to do to, to make some changes getting comfortable with that sort of discomfort of being bad at something. And, and if you practice being failing at, at small things, um, in many cases, it can help you build those muscles so that you don't end up failing at the big things. Um, and, and so one of the ways, uh, after I got back on my feet, after that failure, one of the ways I practiced being bad at something, cause I would, I just had this, this, this narrative, this self narrative that like, I only do things I'm good at. And I was like, well, that seems counterproductive because what if there's something I'm interested in that I'm bad at? (laughs) So I decided to take up long distance running. I am not a natural athlete. I am not a gifted runner. I am a slow, mediocre marathoner, but I decided to pick up running Um, in, in many reasons, because it's like the cheapest of all of the sports. You like, you just have to buy shoes. (laughs) Um, but it, it gave me a chance to like get out there and, you know, run mile after mile very slowly, uh, in a way that says like, I may not be good at things, but I still show up and try and I still give it my best. Right. And, and it was part of the practice was literally changing that internal narrative from, I, I do things I'm good at to, I work really hard and Mm -hmm. I give things a shot. Right. And I'm, yeah. I'm willing to take risks Yeah, because if I you mean, don't take any risks, I mean, anyone who does anything about financial portfolios will tell you risks are the requirement yeah. for rewards, right? There's a relationship there. You're not going to get high returns if you don't take some risk with your portfolio, but if you take risks, there's a chance you're going to fail. So you have to, you got to be ready for that. 
Yeah. And just optimizing for the starting velocity, like you said, just with something that's more easily doable at that point in time, just not always sit and worry about, okay, this is the most uh, scariest thing for me. But if the starting velocity for that is going to be like uh, great levels, then of course, you're not going to do that. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think, like you said, just pick something that's more uh, close by with something like you can immediately try and at least change the narrative about not wanting to try to trying, failing at it, but okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So now that you mentioned a lot about um, this diversification, trying to see how a portfolio fits into your um, daily job or the way you build your side projects and all of this, uh, there's also another angle to this, which I think as from a corporate uh, or, or startup culture point of view, what do you think would be like a change in thinking for employers or companies mm. to accommodate their uh, employees' yeah. welfare or in terms of helping them do most uh, as much as possible as they do at office and outside? This is a really important question. Um, and I wrote this book primarily for individuals. I have sort of like a one page aside to any employers that might be reading the book. But the reaction I've been getting from a lot of like corporate wellness officers and mm. founders who have big teams, um, I've come in and, and started talking at the company level, at the leadership level, because they're really interested in this when it comes to employee well-being. And I think the challenge is historically, most, especially big companies, do not want you to have a side hustle. They do not want you to be doing other things except yeah. your job. And many of them write it into their employment contract that anything mm. you do while you are employed by them, they own the intellectual property of. And anyone who has other options is not going to sign that contract. So from a recruiting standpoint, some companies are really starting to feel the pain uh, the like multidisciplinary, interesting folks saying, mm, no, <laughs> I, I'm not going to do that. Um, but equally so, one of the interesting conversations I just had with a, a startup CMO, I, I came to speak at their company offsite, where he said, look, you know, most of my employees, my younger uh, employees, certainly the Gen Zs and the younger millennials have only ever worked in a boom cycle in the tech world. Mm. Like we have been on an upward trajectory for 10 years. And that is going to change this year. We are now seeing layoffs. We are now seeing like it's this is going to be a hard year for us. And I want them to have a portfolio life because that is going to help them feel more resilient, more, more rested, more balanced, more like a whole human being so that I can get the best out of them because work is suddenly going to feel a lot harder than it used to. And I can't have them burn out in the middle of that. And I thought that was so illuminating. That was like so forward thinking of this yeah. leader to say it benefits me. And, and there's research on this. I quote the research in the book. Like there, there are people who have studied this to say people are better at their day jobs when they have other things in their life outside of their day jobs. It seems obvious, mm -hmm. but we had to back it up with research um, because they, they have that fulfillment. They have that sort of self-actualization. And it's okay if part of their day job is a little bit mundane or they mm. hit some, some tension, some friction in their day job. It doesn't feel life-threatening because yeah. they're grounded and they're fulfilled elsewhere. Mm. So yeah. having that portfolio actually makes them better in times mm. that are challenging. And- and the opportunity for companies really, A, comes down to you got to change those employment contracts um, because most of your employees probably have something they're doing outside of work and they're just lying to you because they know it's not allowed, yeah. right? So, so yeah. this hurts you because you're not seeing the full breadth of their skill set, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the other opportunities for big companies is, especially in maybe a recession or a retraction that we're seeing in the economy where there might not be as much growth where you can offer up and, and, you know, bigger promotions. You could still think about growth opportunities for your employees mm -hmm. diagonally. If you say, yeah. Hey, you are, you know, on our operations team, you run events, you do all sorts of things, but on the side, you've got your own photography business that you run through Instagram. You make some good money off of that. Hey, do you want to freelance for our marketing team? Like, 
we could use a photographer. We're going to pay you for that because that is work unrelated to your day job. Um, and you're going to do it outside of the hours of your day job. But we're going to mm -hmm. give you this opportunity to build this other skill so that maybe your next promotion isn't within the ops team. Maybe you go and take a rotation in the marketing team. But we're going to let you prove yourself and develop that those relationships in your, that portfolio of work mm -hmm. before we do that sort of zigzag promotion. And I think you'd see a lot of younger workers would be really excited by that rather than what they're doing right now, which is we give you a promotion in title. We give you a promotion in you have more responsibility, but yeah. we don't give you any more money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're like, so the benefit of doing good work is unpaid overtime. Awesome. Cool, cool. Like, <laughs> I don't want that, right? So there are other ways that you can offer growth and offer opportunities to your employees that doesn't require just straight up promotions. Mm. And I think that's that's something that employees employers can really yeah, grab you. onto right now. Yeah, fantastic points. And I think all of these examples are very relevant to our day-to-day -day work, right? And for me, I think uh, as much as people think most of this sounds contradictory, to me, it's when there's no restriction, just as you mentioned, when you give mm -hmm. people the room and space to grow and, and to discover a lot of their strengths and mm -hmm. their so-called future strengths, it, it gives them more... Um, okay. Uh, you know, time to open up and build a trust with both the teammate and the companies or the employers in return. Because if they just sort of like keep these people just so restricted, just um, so within the circles, there's no unbridled enthusiasm. There's no energy right. to do what you want to do and, and no space to grow. So yeah, uh, yeah I think it, it really makes sense. And I love this diagonal concept because often what happens is people would just say like, okay, you're good at this. You're doing this out of your job. I mean, uh, that's it. Like we, we do our, have opportunities, but we often don't think about you uh, to fit that into the place. So, and this this diagonal opportunities and trying or encouraging people to do something within their companies, uh, just as a hobby. And even if they really don't want to monetize or they want to monetize, just just willing to listen to what they have in their minds, right? Because that yeah. goes a long way. And often yeah. that's what most employers miss through because they often look at it from their lens, uh, their viewpoint of getting the job done. But it's never mm -hmm. from the welfare or the the wellness aspect of the person who's working to it. And, and we're seeing this in sort of younger workers who are responding saying, look, if this is just going to be a transactional relationship, if this mm -hmm. is just a contract where you can hire me and fire me whenever you desire and, um, and you can demand things without any uh, acknowledgement of what it, it, what it means to me, the impact it might have on my life, like that relationship goes two ways. So I'm not going to do things that are not in my yeah. contract and yeah. I'm not going to do unpaid overtime and I'm not, and we see the reaction. And at least in the U S the employers are suddenly like taken aback by this idea that, that people, people aren't ambitious. I believe was the wall street journal uh, article on this where they're like, people have lost their ambition. They don't want to do the unpaid overtime they used to do. You're like, look, if you can lay them off by email at two in the yeah. morning after having worked for you for 15 years, they're allowed to say no to unpaid overtime, right? It goes both ways. So if you want loyalty, if you want them to understand the impact mm -hmm. of their work on the larger team, then you, you have to understand the impact of the work on their lives and on their growth and on their well-being. So either yeah. it goes both ways for the positive or it goes both ways for the negative. And it's a little bit your choice of which one you want to set up in your culture. Exactly. And high energy comes only with commitment from both the end. It's never going to be, oh, so this employees, it's just so high on energy. So let's use mm -hmm. all the potential. And it's just, yeah. it, it's not like a never ending jar, right? It's never going to always keep going into the jar. You need something to fill in as well. And that's what most of them miss it out. And, and they yeah. entirely put the blame. And if, if the layoffs are, are showing anything, it's this, the fact that uh, you can just, mm -hmm. like you said, sign off people in, in an email without without having the empathy, without having the kind of conversation you would have with them, let's say, when you're supposed to work with them. So mm -hmm. that's really throwing uh, things the other way. And um, yeah. yeah, I guess a lot of um, a lot of learning and unlearning to happen uh, both at the employee and the employer side of things, especially with yeah. the portfolio uh, picture into uh, uh, the yeah. mind. So yeah, thanks for making those points to see that. Sure.
Awesome. So one last question uh, to end our never ending conversation. Uh, you know, I've always already fangirled you enough because we had so many of the things that we uh, were discussing in terms of um, overlaps and intersections um, uh, quite happily, ironically. Uh-huh. There's another thing that I would love for you to share, which is you had great interest in as your mentor and wow. So I remember that you mentioned once about how uh, a class that he took entirely led to the formation of the book, which is How Will You Measure Your Life? So I would love for the listeners to um, take some of those lessons that you've learned uh, yourself from him and uh, the kind of conversations the both of you had. And uh, this is my exact fan boring moment as well. So, yeah. I mean, this book exists and I am on the faculty of HBS because of my relationship with Clay Christensen. Um, the biggest insight that he shared with us in the course of that, that class, which turned into how will you measure your life is that you can and should manage your whole life with the same sort of rigor and commitment that you are thinking about managing your career. And the, a lot of the tools and frameworks that he had been teaching us that, that semester about managing businesses and commensurately managing careers could apply to our lives. And that was the first time that it clicked for me that we've been learning all these frameworks in the MBA that absolutely could apply to to our lives, to to managing our time, managing our money, managing our our portfolios, right? Like these, these frameworks had a lot of power beyond mm. just the co- you know the context they were developed for and and that's what really led me down this path of thinking you know I I talk about in my TED talk that I developed a sales funnel for online dating is how I met my husband um but I used that methodology of like oh it's about like inputs at the top and qualifying criteria and how fast they move through the funnel right like it it's not personal if some stranger doesn't like me it's like we want different things you're not a qualified lead um, and so I like, I used the sales funnel for dating. I used a balanced scorecard for thinking about goal setting. Um, I used the idea of a board of directors, but thinking about my personal board of directors yeah. rather than like imagining there's one mentor somewhere, this mm-hmm. magic mentor who's going to like open all of my doors and like make sure that my career is amazing. You're like, no, that doesn't exist. But I could gather a group of people who care about me and that I care about. So it becomes this two-way relationship and I can think about them as the board of directors helping me set strategy, negotiate things, providing some real talk when I've screwed up, right? Like there's, there's that idea. So, so the last third of this book is really each chapter is like putting on a different C-suite hat and it's like, how do you build your team like a CEO would? How do you tell your story like a CMO would? How do you manage your time like a COO would? How do you manage your money like a CFO? Because if you're going to be the CEO of your life, if you're going to manage your life the same way you would manage a company, you need to have all of these different lenses that Mm. you think through and and can be strategic about rather than reactionary. Um, And so that I I credit him a lot that like this book exists because of him and because of what he taught me. Um, and, and I'm really grateful that I got that chapter of my life. He, he passed in early 2020, just before the pandemic started. Um, and one of the last things that I did before lockdown was get to go to his memorial service. And it was packed like hundreds of, there's probably a thousand people with all the overflow rooms of just people whose lives he had absolutely changed for the better. Um, and I'm really grateful that that was like one of my last in-person memories before our lives all shrunk down to our living rooms yeah. for a little while um, because he was just an incredible man. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you got to spend more time with him, try to learn and try to have interactions. And it, it, it does feel so honored to learn from one of the best minds in the world. And I'm so glad that from whatever we discussed, there's a lot of practicality to what you learn as frameworks. Because yeah. one of the things that often used to um, confuse me is people look for frameworks, but it's it's very difficult to apply it directly to their work path in life. Like I, I mm-hmm. probably could want a theorem, but how would I be able to apply a theorem to my own life at different points in time, especially a sales funnel to dating or uh, start of the 
this whole conversation we had how do you apply product management to your own life get it as a lifestyle mm-hmm. so yeah. a lot of this involves practicality and i'm actually glad that uh, with him a lot of uh, your uh, interactions with him you were able to co-create this you were able to apply yeah. this and uh, yeah thanks for sharing it with us of course Awesome. So thanks a lot, Christina. It was amazing having you on the show. We learned a lot about how to be multi-hyphenates, how to embrace this diversification and how do you look at portfolio carriers? What can you negotiate with your team grants, with your employees and employers and, and a lot of different lenses to this concept of how do you bridge ideas, impact and um, your own interests towards something bigger. So thank yeah. you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.